Okay. So now we're going to go a little bit through the flip side. Because we've been going kind of back and forth between choosing God or choosing Satan. And role playing. Now Satan's not stupid. First of all, it ends up speeding up. Peter calls it hastening the time. He's making a play on the Hebrew word for hastening birth pangs when he says that. Satan's not stupid. He knows that if we really get interested in God, that's going to accelerate spiritual growth and hasten his end. Hasten the development and completion of church. And therefore his time is shortened. Okay, and he's constantly trying to jockey the world for positions so that he can bring about his own version of the millennium before the rapture occurs so that he can prove, he can present to God a nice world that doesn't need God. That's his goal. Now, failing that goal, his backup plan is Armageddon. Alright, so he's trying to bring about a nice world that needs no God. And of course, when you start pitching utopias in the world, it always ends up being a war because everybody's idea of utopia differs and everybody gets so hung up on the concept of utopia that they want to be the ones to bring it about. That's really what Islam is. Islam is a terrorist ideology with a promise of utopia on earth. That's how Catholicism got to be what it was. It was promulgated under the same idea. If we make, you know, this was the, the it first got advanced under Constantine. If we make an empire that's Christian, that will bring about a kind of utopia for the world. That was the sales gimmick. And unfortunately, you know, a lot of people believed in it. But even if they didn't believe in it, it was a great cause to care. It was a great way to rally people around you so that you go to war against the other guy who didn't agree. See, so utopia and war are two sides of a coin. Whenever you hear somebody talking about unity or utopia or better tomorrow, okay, um, that's just another word for war I'm dead serious it's always been that way communism got started based on the same thing communism is a claim of utopia it was first advanced by Karl Marx it produced a whole warlike um, ideology in order to get rid of the so-called bourgeoisie that of course culminated in the Russian Revolution about 50-60 years later it spread to China under the same utopian ideal. You know, the, the emperor was overthrown. And he, you know, the, em the whole empire in China was, was already ailing for quite a long time. The same thing happened in the Reformation. And there the utopian ideal was to get rid of the Catholic Church and establish a Protestant utopia. That's what Calvin thought he was doing. Calvin thought that his own movement was prophesied in Daniel and Revelation as taking over Catholicism. That's how screwed up Calvin was. How e egomaniacal he was. I could tell you lots of stories, but you can read them yourself if you just read about the guy's life. Because the people who are pro-Calvin don't even realize how what they're telling you shows how stupid the Calvin was and how stupid they are. They have no idea how shameful his life is. They think that the shameful things about his life are things that they should be proud of. That's how screwed up they are in their thinking. Well, the same thing is true for the Catholicism. The same thing is true for communism. The same thing is true for socialism. The same thing is true for the French Revolution. The people at the time doing those things are all proud of themselves for doing it. They don't realize what scumbags they really were at the time. It's only after the event's over and you look at it, you realize how bad it was. The same thing's true of the Reformation. The Protestants were as bad, if not worse, than the Catholics that they replaced. And so too, and you know, um, 
eat the revolutions against the royals in each royal family. The revolution against them, the people that were doing it, French Revolution being a good example, were worse. French Revolution, Russian Revolution, that didn't help the poor at all. If anything, what they did was they destroyed property that belonged to the royals that they could have preserved carefully and, get and sold for the benefit of the poor, but they didn't care about the poor. They cared about stealing the property or burning it. The same thing happened in the Chinese Revolution. Okay, so what Satan's going to do to the Christian is pitch a utopian ideal to the Christian to get the Christian all hung up on his behavior in a separate society and hermitage like Calvin's Geneva so that you go off into your little this is where all these you know the Jim Jones cult and all that stuff comes from oh we're going to have our own little group and we're going to have utopia that's where Charles Manson came from it's always a bid for utopia, and then the flip side of utopia is, well, if what we got is utopia, then everybody else is our enemy, and we have to destroy them. That's really how it works. So what Satan's trying to do is bring in the millennium before church is raptured so that he can say, hi, God, see, there's, I, I did what you couldn't do for the human race. And then, of course, since... You know, a utopia always leads to war anyway. He's got this nice little method of destroying as many people as possible, focusing on the Jews. You get that. Sorry I had to bring in so many, you know, topics, but I want you to see the pattern. It's a frequent pattern in history. Satan's been trying it often. And everything I just illustrated to you are actually satanic attempts at bringing about a new world order and then f failing to do so, which inevitably happens, it's used to create war. Very effectively, as you can see from the historical examples given. Now, so what he's going to do to the Christian is try to deflect your interest in God into a kind of new utopia make you think that the spiritual life and life with God is some kind of set of specific behaviors or activities which will get you to think that you're holy so if it's right, and he's always going to use truth to do this. It is right to study Bible. In fact, that is a spiritual life to learn and live on Bible. So he's going to bang the drum on learning and living on Bible. Okay? As if it, it was somehow magical in and of itself, which it's not. The whole goal of spiritual life is just to know God. And if what you want to do is simply know God then that's going to that's gonna steer you clear of a lot of the minefields that Satan builds. Um, but each one of us has got our own insecurities. We've got our own sense of inadequacies. We've got our own tripping points. We've got our own things that we consider to be somewhat in the magical arena. So we find them attractive and we're going to be led astray. So that's one reason why spiritual life takes so long. Is that we have to go through all these issues about what the spiritual life really even is. And it takes almost forever to realize that it has absolutely nothing to do with good deeds. It has absolutely nothing to do with how you feel. It has absolutely nothing to do with anything you do. And that's the most important thing to understand about it. If God creates everything to be independent of himself, everything that he creates is lesser than him, everything that he creates, therefore, having a life of its own, is going to have a life that's divorced from him. In order for it to be independent, it has to be divorced from him. Even so, its very nature and everything about it is actually dependent on him ensuring its existence. 
So what he does is he ensures its independence existence. And that's all dependent, as Hebrews 1 puts it, on the word of his power. At the same time, in order to make it worth its own existence, to make it worth his while to watch it, he inserts himself in everything. Now how does he do that? Well, he's baptizing everything with a meaning that pleases him and justifies its independence existence for his own sake. Because you have to argue that the first and only justice, really, that ought to exist is what's just and fair to God himself. Since he's, got, he's going through all this expense, he's taking care of everything. So what's, what makes that worth his while? Why is, how does this benefit God? Okay. So the God side of things versus the Satan side of things. Not only is about, you know, um, God sustaining everything to have its free existence versus works. But the question of how things ought to be. Should it be free or should it be tyrannical in the name of utopia, which is inevitably what Satan's going to try to do. So that's the next issue there. Another way that Satan's going to attack playing to strengths has to do with the natural, let's kind of use that word in quotes, the natural effects of the supernatural life on your humanity and on your head. I didn't recognize this until lately. When you are growing up as a human being, you are an infant, then you're a child, then you're an older child, then you enter preteen, then you become adolescent, then you become an adult. In each stage, you are leaving behind a whole mindset that goes with the age you were. Now, when you're going through this yourself, you don't see it, but others around you do, especially if they're much older than you. They recognize the stage that you're in, but you don't, because you're in it. It's like when you're in the middle of a firefight. You don't really know what you're going through. You're too busy trying to, you know, get through the firefight. That's why so many bad things happen in war that aren't intended, you know, where you've got friendly fire that, um, you know, counts for sometimes more deaths than, you know, the enemy did. That's why the stuff that happened in Vietnam was happened, a lot of it, was because you couldn't tell the difference between the enemy and the unarmed, truly unarmed civilian. Because a lot of the, um, the Vietnamese were either forced or wanted to have weapons um, giving even to their children. This is what made it so hard. So a soldier could very often make a mistake and hit the wrong person. Okay, they call it collateral damage. And it was a significant issue in the Vietnam War. It's a significant issue um, in the war with the Muslims who are terrorists. Very significant issue. And it's been a significant issue in, in uh, battle as a strategy from time immemorial. Hitting the enemy, um, trying to hit the enemy and you're hitting your friend instead. Satan's very well aware of this. So what he does is he's going to use things that are, as it were, friendly signs of growing up to make you feel that those things are your enemy. When you're a child, you're an infant, you don't have any awareness of your status, really. When you start to become older, you start to have a kind of self-awareness, self-consciousness, sense of insecurity, lots of things that are part and parcel of growing up normally. To a certain extent, somebody who is older than you will 
being around such a person will give you a sense of security beyond yourself. To another extent, you're going to feel threatened by that. Because some people, especially, it depends on how they grow up and what they think about it, but some people regard someone being older or better than them at that moment as a kind of dig at their own insecurities or inferiorities. And so they resent it, they lash out, stuff like that. That's all part and parcel of growing up, resolving those kinds of tensions. It is especially acute when you're between stages. And you'll notice this in children. Somebody who's, say, six or seven years old is going to look at a four, or five, three-year-old. Well, he's just a child. Or he'll be very protective of the younger person. You'll have both attitudes manifest in a, an older child because he's close to that stage, but he's departed from it. The same is true between older children and, say, preteen, you know, 11, 12, just coming up on the teens. Because um, we usually say teen when we mean 13 and, and older when we call it teens. So a preteen is usually described as being 10, 11, 12. And a preteen will look at the teens usually in a favorable light because he wants to fancy himself among them. And he'll look at the 9-year-old, 8-year-old, 7-year-old, 5-year-old. He won't be so threatened by the 5-year-old, but he'll be, he'll be threatened by the 8- or 7-year-old. He'll have a need to put them down because they're close to him in age. He's trying to disassociate himself from his previous age. Alright? The same is true when you have a difference between somebody in their teens and young adults. They will try to associate with other teens to feel that they belong to a new group to disassociate themselves from their parents. And they will also try to claim themselves as adults, which they really aren't, in order to gain a certain a compensation for being... Um, not really an adult. So they will be hostile to someone near in age to them but younger in order to disassociate themselves. Or they will be overprotective pretending to themselves that they are adult now and therefore parental. Are you getting the psychology of this? When you're close to some other age that's younger than you or another age that's older than you you're at a sort of crossroads and you're trying to identify your own relationship to the younger and to the older, to the higher and to the lower. It's a similar problem in, you know, hierarchical society or a company, you know, an institution or a corporation, that sort of thing. Someone close to you in status or pay grade, but higher or lower there's going to be a need to distinguish yourself and you're going to experience a temptation to be hostile or protective figuring out where do you align yourself this common psychological condition of humans it's especially true in spiritual life okay people who and it is even more marked because for the most part Christians uh, don't grow as they're supposed to and in uh, spiritual grow growth it's supposed to roughly parallel um, regular maturation as a human being in other words the ideal is where you find out about Christ and you believe in him when you're a young child physically and then as you grow as a, into um, human adulthood you also grow into spiritual adulthood that's the way it's ideally designed but it doesn't happen that way what happens instead is that you have a bulk of Christian humanity who are age 50 going on 5 spiritually. They have no clue about God whatsoever, therefore they're very prickly, therefore they're very intimidated, therefore they're, they're trying to position themselves, and do I be the sweet brother so-and-so and the little wimpy pastor so-and-so idea, which, which stereotype of Christianity do I buy, and then when I buy that one I have to hate all other ideas of Christianity because I, I'm five years old mentally and I need to align myself with someone to feel secure. That's the way it goes. 
So there's a lot. That's why there's so much warring in Christianity. We got a bunch of Christian babies who uh, who physically um, are not babies, and your spiritual um, retardation is going to um, retard you mentally as well. The only way out of um, emotional retardation for a Christian is to mature spiritually. My pastor spent a lot of time on that. It took me a long time to understand what he's talking about. Okay. You got that, those patterns. There's a direct analogy between physical and emotional development, even if we exclude the whole spiritual life angle. The spiritual life angle, you just multiply all of the intensities about a thousand times. Okay, now added to that. And Satan's exploiting all this, okay? Added to that is you're actually growing out of being human. The whole idea was for Christ's deity and his humanity to have a total unity at all points. The structural unity was there at birth, but the functional unity wasn't there until the cross completed. Because deity and humanity he had to keep on willing to shield him his human mind from what his deity knew he had to keep on being willing not to use his deity powers to benefit himself in certain other ways yet he had to use his deity to hold the universe together okay and you, you see some of that when you look at Matthew 4 you see some of the problem there you also see more of it in Hebrews 1 and 2, which is basically explaining the problem. By staying, it would have been a sin for him to tap his own deity for himself, to benefit himself. Okay, and that's what Satan was t trying to tempt him to do in Matthew 4. Alright. So Christ himself, in his humanity, had to go beyond his humanity functionally. And what does that mean? That means divine quality thinking occurring in his human soul. That quality occurring in his human soul at a certain level paid for sins. And we're told that flat out in Isaiah 53 11. I keep harping on that. In my, in my badly pronounced Hebrew, it's Badato Yatzdik. Badato means by means of truth, knowledge, and Yatzdik means he makes righteous. It wasn't by means of him bleeding to death on the cross. He didn't bleed to death anyhow. After he was dead, the soldier stuck in the spear, and out came, you know, the, the blood had already separated, so it says water and blood clots. All right? He didn't bleed to death. His physical death didn't pay for sins. He said it is finished before he died. Tetelestai. Which means it's finished in the present with results that go on forever. Okay? I mean, if you to, you know, expand the translation the way the Greek tense really is communicating it. He was alive when he paid for sins. His death on the cross was a victory, symbolic victory. Into my hands, into your hands, I commit my spirit, O God of doctrine. Psalm 37 was what he quoted. When Luke records the event, um, you know, because the others didn't say fully what he had said, the the Luke quotation will lead you to Psalm 37. Okay, Psalm 31, 5. I'm sorry, I got I just got corrected. Anyway, the point is that. He was already victorious, that's why he, he can deposit his spirit with Father. And he himself, as Jesus Christ, wholly united functionally now, because he's paid for all sin. Bing! He's done that. And when I say wholly united functionally, think about the fact that your arms and your legs are attached to your body at birth. That does not mean you know how to use them in a coordinated manner. And even if you know how to use them in a coordinated manner, there are always better degrees of coordination and in more ways to coordinate that you could learn that you didn't know yesterday. When you practice piano with your fingers, you have to do it over and over and over, and each time you do, normally speaking, you will get better and better and better at playing the same notes. And you will also get better, it's a sort of cross-training thing, at playing notes of new pieces you didn't know before. 
because the, the, the mind-finger interface is getting lots and lots of practice. And so your, your mind is commanding your fingers to move a certain way. And because you do it over and over and over again, the actual function of what's already connected gets better. It's that kind of idea. Okay, well the same thing happens in the spiritual life for us. The more you learn and live on doctrine, the more fluent you become in it. It's like learning a language. The more it's thought changes your own thinking. Your tastes change. Your interests change. You're still you. You're actually what you... You're, you're spiritually maturing as a person. Your interests as a spiritually mature person are not like they were when you were a spiritual child. And along the way, there's a kind of dying that occurs. You are no longer a spiritual child, like Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 13. When I was a child, I thought and spake as a child. But when the, when the perfect, meaning the complete, the word translated perfect really means complete. It's teleo. When the perfect has come, when the complete has come, you know, then I'm, it's a whole different story. And he's talking about the perfect, meaning the complete scripture in that verse. Because 1 Corinthians 13 is on the head, which is the completion of scripture very clever analogy that Paul's drawing okay so the point is is that when you're growing spiritually the just completed age you have gone past will be most irritating to you because you want to disassociate yourself from it and the spiritual age that's just ahead of you will be will be either intimidating and will be also irritating for that reason or you'll be like thinking of yourself in those terms because that's where you're entering now the farther you go in the spiritual life the more irritated you get with the earlier ages of the spiritual life and the more distance there is between the age you are now and the age that has gone the more distance in age the less irritated you are. In other words, a six-year-old is not irritated with a two-year-old baby. But a six-year-old is going to be irritated with a three-year-old or a four-year-old. A six-year-old is going to look up to an eight-year-old or a ten-year-old. Or might even be irritated in the sense of intimidated. When you're 20 years old, you're not intimidated by a six-year-old kid. Unless emotionally you two are not that far away in age. Okay, growing out of humanity is a similar idea. The closer you are, you're, you're literally growing out of being human. All the tastes and needs and desires and, what do you want to call it, um, perspective, viewpoint, interest, that's native to being human. You start to lose those. The more you learn and live on Bible, the more the way God looks at things becomes your way of looking at things. Truly. Remember I said God's practicing righteousness, he just flat loves it. He's not doing it to, to have a good opinion of himself. It's because he really loves the way it tastes. That's the way it comes for you too. That's inhuman. The things that used to, this is one reason why, you know, you'll often hear people say, well, as you mature, you'll sin less. Well, actually, you don't sin less. You change the kinds of sins you sin. The sins that attract the babyish spiritual Christian, the spiritual baby Christian, don't attract you. You grow out of them. And new kinds of sins attract you instead, and you don't even necessarily realize your sins. But in the very later stages, what's really the hardest to do, or hardest to live with, is you're actually dying to being human. And when you're a baby Christian, you sort of know this, you know that that's a goal. Because everybody says, oh, we should die to ourselves. Yeah, but you can't make yourself do that. You can't make it happen. It happens because the Bible in your head changes the way you want to think. And you really do die to yourself. But you don't even notice that that's what's happening for a long time. And one of the signs that it is happening is that you get irritated with your fellow Christians who are much younger than you are. 
and not uh, um, when I say much younger, let's say younger. Those who are much younger, you're not so irritated with. Those who are a little bit younger, you're very irritated with. And you sort of uh, put on a pedestal Christians who are spiritually older than you. Now, the advantage of knowing this is that you can tell where you are on the map as a sort of quick, you know, self-diagnosis. What Christians do you admire? What Christians intimidate you? What Christians just irritate the heck out of you? And if you can, usually you can, once you're in spiritual adulthood anyway, or spiritual adolescence, you can usually identify the spiritual age of the one ahead of you and the one behind you. Not precisely, but you can you can get some kind of handle on it. And in fact, that's why I keep on saying that Christian theology is in the playpen. Because the spiritual age of the church fathers was less than five years old. It's real obvious. They couldn't. They had to argue over whether God was one or three. If you're arguing that, your spiritual age is under age five. They didn't even know what the gospel was. They're under age five. They're spreading gossip. They're under spiritual age five. They never grew up. They never hit spiritual adulthood. None of them. I mean, as far as the writings we have go. Now, it's possible that, that the writings we have really weren't of those people. It's possible that they wrote what they wrote that we have when they were spiritually younger and things changed substantially afterwards. But if you go by what's written by the so-called church fathers, both, you know, Nicene and anti-Nicene, They're nothing. If you go by the Reformation writers like Calvin and Luther, they were spiritual adults. And Calvin looks like he might have gotten as far as spiritual adulthood and then went retrogressing because of his anti-Semitism. He had some high moments. But at the end of his life, he was a spiritual idiot, praising himself. I gave you poor do pure doctrine. That was one of his, you know, deathbed speeches. Oh, really? Is that what a spiritually mature person would say? He was complaining. A spiritually mature person doesn't do that. It's not that they don't have bad moments, but they don't brag like that. Now, When you're also retrogressing in the spiritual life, you're also irritated by Christians. So this is where it gets a little bit dicey. Generally speaking, however, if you're trying to diagnose where you are, look at the Christians you admire, or Christian groups that you admire, versus the ones that you, dis you despise, disdain, don't want to be around. If you're thinking that the church fathers are you know, they write well, they're spiritual, then honey, you, you're not even out of potty training yet, spiritually. That's it. End of story. If you think that, you know, somebody with a nice voice and brother this and sister that, and they're always nice and, and they think that you, you know, you have to do good deeds and stuff like that, you think that's spiritual advance, you're not out of potty training yet. Conversely, you could be on your way down and you think that way because you're on your way down, you're retrogressing. In other words, you're not out of potty training yet, but the question is which direction are you going in, up or down? The cure for either case is learn and live on Bible. Use 1 John 1 9. Ask God, you know, who's your right teacher? Get in God's system, the whole God system video that I did. Because this is what Satan is going to do. He's going to get our eyes on other Christians, our eyes on things, so that instead of focusing, and, and, and the reason why it's so effective is because we're already in turmoil. 
when you're in the spiritual life, you're in a kind of internal turmoil because your, your thought is being completely revamped. The more you learn and live on Bible, the harder it is to live. Because you're learning, you're, 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 you're growing out of being human and there's a little bit of death going on every day. When Paul said, I die to myself daily, that's how the spiritual life actually works. But you don't n recognize it for what it is. You're leaving the standards of this life. And the standards of God are replacing it and it's a painful process. It's like teething. It's, it's like any kind of growing up. So you're constantly betwixt in between. You might as well be on the rack. Being pulled in all kinds of directions. Satan takes advantage of that. And so you want to try to just basically, I mean, you almost have to do this like a mantra. Just learn and live on Bible, learn and live on Bible, use 1 John 1, John 1 9, learn and live on Bible, learn and live on Bible, and try to like ignore how you feel. Because you can, you know, analyze it 16 ways to Christmas and it's not going to change how you feel. Because what's happening to you is you're dying. You're dying to the old life. You're dying to the old values. You're dying to this world. And it's a process that naturally comes, naturally comes from learning and living on Bible. And there's really no cure for it. By the end of your life, when you reach spiritual maturation, you will be a human being in your body, in your soul. You're uniting to God, and that's a whole different thought pattern. Now, because he's God and because you're in a body, there's a lot of overlap. But the meaning of life to you is entirely different when you're spiritual mature. It just is. The things that mattered to you when you were a spiritual child just don't matter anymore. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter what people think of you. It doesn't matter if you eat or sleep or anything else. It doesn't matter whether you watch television. It doesn't matter if you have what you enjoy. It doesn't matter whether you're hurting and it doesn't matter whether you feel good. What matters is what's right and what's wrong and you're actually living for righteousness and you don't even think about it that way. You think about it in terms of obedience and you're going to fool yourself and tell yourself, well, I ought to do this, I ought to do that. But really what it is is that the things that you're claiming you ought to do is really what you want to do because you're becoming like God. God isn't doing right or practicing righteousness because he ought to. He's the one who invented what righteousness we call righteousness is. We wouldn't even know what it is if he didn't invent it. It's wholly his fabrication. The whole definition of righteousness is entirely his fabrication. And he's doing it because he wants to. It's arbitrary. And at the, you know, at the end of the spiritual life, that's maturation. That's how you are too. And it's very um, disconcerting. To your whole humanity, your whole, you know, your whole human nature. Human nature can't do this. That's what Romans 8, 1 through 10 is about. And so it's trying to cope with the change by saying right, wrong, I'm a good person if I do this, I'm a good person if I do that. But that's not your real motive anymore. You've died to the, oh, I must do this to be a good person, um, reasoning. That's not really your reasoning, but your your body's going to come up with that analogy. You still will phrase it that way, but that's not your motive anymore. Your motive is just like God's. It doesn't taste good unless you do what's right. It doesn't taste good to you, for its own sake, whether you get anything for it or not. And that's totally the opposite of the way the human mind works. That's totally the opposite of the way the world works. Everything the world does is to assuage ego. The entire motive of absolutely everything on this planet is to assuage ego, to make ego feel good, to, to pride self. It's, a, it's an insecurity complex. That's basically what sin brought into the world. When the woman grabbed that fruit, she grabbed it to get something she didn't have. Because she felt inferior. 
the temptation was hi if you eat this fruit you will know as you will be as good as God so she was trying to assuage an inferiority complex and all it did was permanize it so the whole world is running on an inferiority complex that's the essence of the sin nature make good do good be good get better get better get more to get rid of the inferiority complex it's like Lady Macbeth's damned spot we killed our happiness back in the garden and we're trying to get it back again happiness meaning that you didn't care about whether you were superior or inferior or anything else it wasn't relevant and it isn't relevant because God's pouring himself into you anyhow that's the problem is that you're losing your need for the things of this world to buttress your ego and it comes off as being like not interested in the world you know when James says we're, we're and the Lord said it before him you're in the world but not, you're not of it anymore and James was talking about that in James 2 you know to be unstained from the world unstained from the world doesn't mean you don't sin it means that the world's motives the world's ideas which are all founded on an insecurity complex don't don't get to you anymore I mean it's not like they don't get to you at all but they don't stick the hit like you know maybe a punch and then you you're like a Joe Palooka doll you get back up again and that's what defeats Satan in the trial because there's nothing that Satan can offer with his good deeds plan that can create that kind of um, secure security it's it's above human it's the way Christ thought It's a total, um, well, I, I, total isn't really the right word to use. It's the closest thing to total righteousness functionally that there is, as a mindset, not necessarily execution. It's your motive, it's your mindset, it's why you want to live, it's why you want to do things. It's the thing that matters to you, and Paul's expressing it in Romans 7. In my soul, I see it's good and right and true, and I believe in it, but then I look at my body and I find out I'm not doing that. See, his mind already converted to the divine standard. Really, truly converted. It's really what he wants. It's not a question of Paul thinking better of himself. It's what he finds tasty. And then I look at my body and I see, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not behaving the way I believe in. Okay? You're, you're splitting off. There's a death occurring. You're splitting off from your human nature. It's not merely um, a progressive separation from your sin nature. It's a separation from your human nature. All the attitudes that go with being human aren't necessarily sin attitudes. But you're growing out of being human. And Satan's out to exploit that and it, it takes a lot of forms like um, oh if you don't spend a lot of time with other people then you don't care about people and you know it's like well you should care about people well yeah you should but in a certain way in a certain context the guy who's a soldier out in Iraq is not with anybody he's by himself on patrol or whatever you can't say he doesn't care about people because he's by himself. He's got a job he's doing that obviously proves he cares for people, but he's not with them. A baby will think, well, if you're not with me, you don't love me. See the difference? And, you know, certain other attitudes in the human race about what constitutes love or good or bad are not wait a minute certain other attitudes in the human race about what's good and bad like oh if you're a Christian you have to talk nice all the time Christ never did that God never does that so I guess Christ isn't Christian oh if you're a Christian you're supposed to say brother and sister and you're not supposed to drink and dance or go with anybody who does those things those are all baby attitudes and in the human race, oh, if you don't give to charity, you're a bad person. 
No. Sometimes giving to charity is the worst thing you can do. You see, we have a lot of childish notions about what good and bad is. And if people don't conform to those childish notions, we assume that they're, they're, they, you know, that they're bad. And of course, the difference is, uh, you know, exploited by those who, okay, well, if I talk nice, I can talk you out of your money. You see the point? As you mature, you you don't fit the common idea of human, of love, of good, of bad. Because the common idea of anything is not the truth. It's the childish idea. It's the infantile view of things. That's what common, anything mass, anything popular, anything common is always false and childish and sweet. And physical. And oversimplified and black and white. And if you don't fit those stereotypical ideas, whoa, well then, then you're no good. So you see, you're separating from. You're not like the masses. So the masses, because they're childish, are uncomfortable and intimidated by you. Because they're perennially insecure. That creates a tension between you and the masses. But it also means there's a death going on inside your own soul. Because you're not like that anymore. And it's heightened because you're like thinking more and more like God. And so you're less and less human. And Satan exploits that. It's a very painful process all by itself, even without the exploitation. And the only solution to it is learn and live on Bible. Keep looking at God. Keep remembering why you're going through this. Because you're going through it alone. In the fundamental, we live alone, we die alone. The people around us, well, there's a certain amount of, you know, connection. But you can only live the spiritual life alone. The relationship to God is vertical. Any relationships to humans are nice, maybe more than nice. But in the final analysis, you're living alone. And that's the ultimate fight for independence. And that's the ultimate definition of maturation. When you can actually be alone. Because honey, we're all going to die alone. Ironically enough, that's the one thing we all have in common. Peace out.